on to today's topic, um, I'll introduce our speaker here in a second. We'll be, we'll be talking about a, a virus tracker that we've created. It's an open source reference application deployed to the cloud that tracks viruses across, across the country using Hyperledger Fabric and, and blockchain network. So this reference application um, is available open source. We have all the information here to get to GitHub repository with all the information there. So we'll also uh, put this link up in the chat notes and um, meetup information. So you're, you're able to reference that and get to all that information. So um, I think we're ready to go ahead and turn it over to our speaker, David Pitt, who is also a principal at Keyhole Software. And um, Dave, you wanna go ahead and take over the screen? All right, we'll Should do. Should be good to go. Great, okay. thanks. All right. Okay, I see your screen. Yep. Screen? Great. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Oops, sorry. I hit the wrong button. I apologize. Go back to this. Yes, yeah. we saw the, uh, we saw the, yeah. uh, I hit the wrong, I, I yeah. trying to get that out of there just one second. I will be back on. Board. Okay. All right. See that? There you go. Okay, great. Well, thanks everyone for joining. Um, this is something we've been working on for a while. Um, Hyperledger Fabric is a uh, framework that we've been uh, getting some competencies in for a couple, three years now. And uh, we're always um, trying to evangelize uh, uh, blockchain use cases in general. And uh, the framework that we have the most experience with is, is Fabric. So that's why uh, uh, we've been spending our time with it. Um, uh, today, I'd like to go through the, and present to you the, um, the uh, uh, a, a, a implement, blockchain implementation that basically helps track uh, test results. We originally built this uh, for just general viruses like influenza, just because we thought it was a good use case for that, and we've adapted it for COVID, so we actually handle both tracking of both types of viruses. Actually, it can be any kind of virus. But really, what I want to uh, maybe pass off today is the is the is the uh, the case for using blockchain technology. Um, so with that, I'll go through these these slides talking about them. Pretty free form. Uh, I don't have my chat up, so if anybody has a question, feel free to pop in there and I'll try to answer it. At the end, we'll have some time for it also. But um, uh, like I said, if anybody has something pops in your head and you want to uh, present it now, just unmute and give me a shout. So, why blockchain? So, you know, blockchain, everybody knows that the, the, the killer use case for it was cryptocurrency. Um, that's what it was invented for, and that's where the technology spawned from. And um, uh, it, um, you know, it's that understands. And, and initially, we always have the, the problem with trying to tell people, well, you know, blockchain is not cryptocurrency. It's not Bitcoin. It's, it's, a, it's a distributed um, ledger technology um, that happens to be applied to a use case of cryptocurrency. But other use cases haven't really been super obvious. I mean, I'm gonna in a second here talk through uh, the, the, the kind of the, the initial use case, which is the supply typical supply chain use case. Um, and, th and this is more than, this is actually in production. This is the, uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, press has been out there and there's a lot of actual production implementations right now for supply chain, you know, Walmart, IBM, Merck Shipping, you can go on and on. And it, it is a pretty obvious use case, but I, in present, talking about blockchain technology last couple of years or so, I do get asked by practitioners, people to say, why not use traditional IT infrastructure? And that's an immediate reaction. And that's a, a valid point. Why not use just our current IT capabilities, our current architectures, and, and why is blockchain better? And that's really what I want to try to transfer today is why we, in some cases, not all cases, but blockchain technology is a, is a better solution. So when you take a this, this supply chain target, and this is very simplistic, so hopefully it makes sense, but you have a grower, a buyer, an importer, a freight, a forwarder, a distributor, a seller. These, I'm not a supply chain person, but these are kind of the actors involved in, in the supply chain. And each of these actors or organizations or entities 
as they move, let's say coffee, um, this is a grower. So let's say it's some kind of um, a plant material, agricultural material like coffee, you know, they're going to go ahead and have, they're going to make their beans and, you know, somehow record that they sold some beans to a buyer. And then that buyer is going to somehow record and track that they sold that um, these beans to an importer and to the freight forwarder and the distributor and the seller all along, you know, the grower may be somewhere in Columbia. So they may not have a, a sophisticated uh, IT system. They may just have a, a paper in a file cabinet. Maybe not. Maybe they got it on their mobile phone or maybe they got a thing. But needless to say, they still have a data store for it. And that information is stored in there. And same with the buyer and same with the importer. And they're all implementing um, some kind of uh, data store, some kind of IT implementation to, to uh, store this information. Likewise, they're also trying to transfer this information, right? So the, the nutshell of this is, it's being copied multiple times and multiple technologies. There's no single, you know, the, 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 the information about those beans, um, uh, the, the source of truth for the grower is in his file cabinet and down to the freight forward, it's in their database somewhere, their relational database or their wherever, the, wherever that is at. That information has been copied and touched and it's not the single proven thing. People can get involved with it. You know, if, I, if I'm in a big freight forwarder, uh, company and I have IT staff and they have DBAs and admins and things like that, you know, that there's no guarantee that that, that information has not been changed or updated or not lost. They're, you just don't know. It's just, you're up to that. So that's the, the, where we're at today in IT is it's being copied multiple times. Even though it's digital or paper, it hasn't changed that much. I mean, we've re basically been copying information like that forever. You know, if you have a, 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 have a document in the old days before IT, they would just Xerox it or copy it and mimeograph it. And it's copied again, right? And that's pretty, that's pretty solid, but that can also be altered. So anyway, the information is being copied uh, across no single source of truth. So some people have presented to me saying, well, what about a centralized approach? We don't need blockchain. You know, let's, let's just go ahead and have an organization provide a centralized supply chain solution. Some company um, invents um, uh, supply chain software, which they have SAP or whoever else, and they and they set up a multi-tenant um, software application that serve, does all this. We're not copying it anymore. All the growers, all the buyers, they can all sign up for my for my software as a service uh, implementation. You know, Dave Pitts supply chain software as a service. Give you user ID and password, and they have access to it. And then we have one centralized database, and that would solve a lot of the copying problem because everybody could share and do it. Um, but A, it's kind of proprietary. I mean, you're going to be, you're going to be locked into the Dave's supply chain um, software as a service. And um, it requires, um, it eliminates, you know, uh, it, but it, it, is, is it truly a single source of truth? And it really is. And it is, there's one database there that has it, but again, it's vendor locked in um, and if something goes wrong with that single database, then we're, we're out, we're, we're out of business. Or if we want to move, we don't have an option. So that's the centralized view of this. But, but there's single point of failure, as I indicated, and a non-blockchain data repository is not trustworthy, right? So in other words, and I'm, I'm going to go into this in a second, but, you know, if it's just stored in some traditional data store, you know, there's access rights. I mean, there, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with um, data stores that are popular, such as SQL. Um, and these are, this is a, a, a database that a lot of enterprises are going to be using and maintaining. And you can put access control on it. Um, you can say who can change things and grant privileges. That's all available. You can, you can make it secure and control who are doing it. But the problem is, is it's only secure as the people that have access. And the blockchain technology it's immutable. Can't change it. Even if you have access, it can't be changed. It's, it's there. It's, it's, it's immutable. And the provenance and trust can be guaranteed um, with blockchain technology. Provenance and trust can't be with a traditional data store because somebody with access can still update it and change it. You know, there is there are audit trails and things like that, but it can still be lost. But it can be changed. Changed. Um, Single port of failure is your the the all the the supply chain growers and participants are relying upon Dave's software as a service to make sure they're backing up 
their da their database and restoring it properly. That, that's just, that's that's should happen. But how many? How think of how many stories you've heard in the news about um, uh, databases being hacked or lost? You know, because of failure to back up. I've had in my, in my personal experience, I've had many times a major software companies where uh, data we've come in and the data the database has been failing for for days on end and we didn't know. They just didn't, they failed. The day the day make a password procedure failed, they didn't know. Well, the reason blockchain is better than a centralized approach is because the larger the network, the more stable you are, because that data is distributed and caught and not copied, but distributed throughout the network. So if you have all the nodes and all the participants, it, you know, they all would have to um, go down and be destroyed to lose this information. So there's power in numbers and there's stability in numbers and the distributed nature of, 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 of blockchain supports that. And again, it's the access to information is centrally curled, not transparent, meaning, you know, if, if, if I'm Dave software as a service and I'm um, offering APIs up and things like that, that, you know, uh, that data source is, you know, you're going through a, a veneer or, a, or some kind of API gateway or something. And uh, um, that's, uh, you know, that that's not transparent. That's not transparent access. In the blockchain technology, as transactions are being added to the blockchain, all the participants are seeing it and, and, and seeing these transparent um, transactions happening and being presented to the, to the network. You guys hear me okay? Matt, is this coming through all right? Yep, yep, sounded great. Okay, good, thanks. Yep. Um, uh, so that leads us into a distributed blockchain. That's the operative word here. Um, blockchain is a, is a distributed technology. Um, and with that, um, you see the databases being shared. So as, as these growers, buyers, and importers, and uh, freight forwarders, distributors, and sellers all um, add transactions to the network, they are being distributed throughout nodes and they all may have their own node or they may have access to a node. That's another whole discussion. But the key is, is you're going to want multiple nodes for stability and, and in a pretty close real time fashion, those transactions will appear and they will be in a blockchain format. Therefore they can trust that those transactions are real. They came from a, they have providence that came from a certain place and that they have not been changed. So here's the elevator pitch for, I'm sure you've all heard for why blockchain is better. It's immutable that covered. There's providence and trust in the, in the, in the data that resides in it. There's transparency to where you can see um, where it came from and who actually added the transactions. Um, there's decentralization, no single point of failure, meaning there's, there's more robustness and stability in, in the overall system because the whole network would have to be taken down or lost for, for um, everything to be lost. Uh, there's a consensus mechanism, which leads to trust and immutability um, or trust and, and, and providence to where um, those transactions that are being put, you get the, the consensus mechanism helps ensure that they are coming from, uh, that, they're, that they're valid. And this is arguable. This last point is arguable. I, 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 I can't give you hard numbers on that. At some point, I think we're going to try. We're, we're we are internally we we're, we stand up some of our own networks and on in the cloud and try to get some costs on this. But my a thought experiment indicates that a blockchain network, the, this this supply chain system overall would have lower cost only because the IT involved in each entity having to implement a database, a server, hire programs for an API, all that all that. The, the care and maintenance of individual data stores and to support that in theory is more expensive than, than an existing blockchain framework like Hyperledger that you can stand up and all the mechanics are in place. Again, I, I, I can't, I wish I could give you some numbers for that. I, at some day, I think I would, but I, we feel like it's an overall lower cost of ownership uh, of, of sharing this data through a blockchain network distributed ledger, as opposed to, everybody building their own. 
it still cost. You still got to have the nodes, you still have to have IT. It's not free, um, but uh, uh, that's arguable. But that, I still put that in there because I feel like it is. So I keep talking about immutability and trust, and and, and this is just you know again, I, forgive me if this is too too much blockchain 101, but what makes it immutable is, is really the cryptographic hashing. It's pretty straightforward. It's really cryptographic science that has made this possible. It's pretty cool, but basically I can take any uh, string of bytes of any length, whatever, and run it through a, a hash function, and I'm going to get a fixed length unique ID. It's going to be fixed length for anything. If I have a you know, a, a 10 byte string to a, 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 you know, a million byte string, if I run it through this cryptographic hash, I'm going to get a unique 256 um, uh, hex kind of uh, result uniquely that uniquely identifies that payload. And if anything changes in that at all, one little byte changes in it, that will no longer be valid. And with current um, technologies and computing power, that's pretty and I can say impossible to to hack, meaning to try to duplicate. So if you were at a block and you wanted to try to change it to where somehow you got that hash back, it would be, that's impossible. Uh, but if you wanted to go ahead and update your blockchain hashes that are in there through all the connected blocks trying to do this, it would take probably millions of years to, to try to do it through current computing power. And I guess possibly quantum computing power is, uh, possible so that things may change if we get widespread quantum computing um, uh, capabilities but for right now it's immutable and so what happens with these hashes we just we, we hash of hash of hashes so the block all the blocks have all these all these transactions that are going in in the case of of the crypt of the uh, supply chain you're going to have uh, you know uh, uh, growers selling their uh, selling their uh, their beans and where they're where, where, where bought at and that's going that's going to be a transaction let's say in in a block and I have many transactions you know thousands upon thousands upon transactions and they're all going to be put formed into a block and all those transactions are going to be hashed and all that payload is going to be hashed and all the block information is going to be hashed and then it's going to be the hash of the previous block is going to be put in there it's it's going to be in there it's hashed with the hash and so they're just these hashes that um, uh, of the blocks together. And so you can kind of see how it'd be pretty impossible to try to change that, to try to hack that. Um, and it's worth pointing out, and I like to point this out, you know, people go, well, uh, 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 cryptocurrency has been hacked all the time. People losing money and things like that. That's not the blockchain technology being hacked. Somebody's not coming in and changing the block the data. They are hacking the exchange points. So the hacks that have occurred to date um, are not a uh, blockchain technology a properly applied has not been hacked. The science hasn't been hacked or changed. It's been access to the cryptocurrency blockchains via the exchanges. So what has hacked, hacked is key, uh, pr public private keys have been leaked um, or bad APIs into it or, or hacked or whatever, but people are hacking into, they're getting keys and being able to do transactions illegally. But that's not this technology as far as the, the blockchain of, uh, hashes and um, nested together has not been hacked. So I think that's worth changing. But basically, you can't really detect a change and the, in the uh, so that uh, you can see how that's what makes this immutable. And this this so the data in Dave's um, supply chain software as a service blockchain that I put out there network that we, we operate would basically users of it would realize that when those transactions happen and consensus is applied and they're committed to the blockchain, that's truth, single source of truth. I can trust that that hasn't changed or, or can be changed. Hey, Dave. Yeah. Just to let you know, I think we have um, some restrictions on chat. We're trying to figure that out to be able to open it up. So I don't know if anybody's able to, to put, put questions in chat. So. If anybody has any questions, please please chime in and and uh, just unmute, unmute and, and chime in. So I think we're working on trying to fix chat. So okay, yeah, great. All right. So providence of trust. So um, 
you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm making a big assumption here. You know, the, the, the blockchain use cases I'm talking about are what I would refer to as permissioned. Um, Fabric is, is a permissioned blockchain. That's the only option you have. In other words, that, that pub, PKA, public private key infrastructure is applied. Um, uh, but that still applies to uh, uh, public uh, blockchains like, um, uh, like uh, Bitcoin. I mean, basically, they're using public private keys to uh, um, execute transactions. So the PKI public key infrastructure is a huge part of blockchain, and it's, it's necessary because we can have um, uh, we can sign transactions and sign blocks and know also identity and um, identify um, you know who's doing what, and these these users are valid in Fabric. Everybody's going to have a, a digital certificate to access the network. Those can be revoked and approved and so everybody participating in the in a, in a, in a permission blockchain is 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 uh is identified who they are and then um they have their own unique uh digital certificate to get access so in in business use case in many businesses and use cases uh of blockchain that's that's super important um you know in the in the in the uh, supply chain example that'd be important you know you'd have to you know, have have uh, um, uh, be issued a digital certificate and a public private key to, to do work and, and participate into it, and that would know. And this leads to um, uh, the probably the and I'm going to I'm going to have a, I have a note on this at the end of the presentation. But really, the hardest part of, of of blockchain technology and the reason, other than which use cases they apply for, um, is the is the operation and ownership and governance of of of, of a blockchain. That's the hard part because really blockchain makes sense when there's um, not one organization just using it. It's when there's lots of organizations in an association or consortiums or et cetera that are, that are wanting to participate. And so, so who issues the certificates, who sets up the nodes, who does that? Somebody it's got to start somewhere. And so that's, that's what we found a, a difficult part is who's the operator and providing governance over this whole thing. And that's where, uh, um, I think there's been some probably some headwinds in, in some things, but uh, um, the transactions that are ex executed uh, by trusted parties um, um, can be signed. And there's, you know, the consensus mechanism is the, is the process that makes these transactions end up in the blocks in everybody's node and everybody's and uh, the proof of work is the most popular one. That's Bitcoin uh, has exploded that. Um, Ethereum uses it and um, proof of stake, proof of elapsed time. There's, there's a many consensus mechanisms out there. I won't get into that now. The kind of the veto, vetoable one is what Fabric uses, the where you can have um, endorsing um, entities that that will um, approve transactions, sign the transactions, everything matches up, it's good, and you can figure that. You know, that's not. There's no one way to do it. That's just how your organization is going to work, and that helps scalability. Right. So um, Fabric's got a, a pretty good cons fast consensus mechanism because you can, you know, control the number of, of endorses that are going to go ahead and endorse that. And consensus can be reached a lot quicker than something like a proof of work. That's another talk altogether. But the, the, the reason I bring that up is the, the, the PKI with the consensus mechanism is going to go ahead and, and enforce the provenance and trust in those transactions living in blocks. In the blockchain. So that kind of teed up, um, you know, kind of my, my point here was why blockchain technology was, um, is, uh, um, is uh, good, why, why it, the, the use case for it. So what we did, uh, um, I want to show you now a, uh, an actual implementation, right, from all these concepts. And so we built uh, a, a uh, let's, let's first off talk about this use case, which is a, a lab testing result. So this is a big diagram here, a lot going on. I'll try to talk to it really quick, but kind of like the supply chain um, example, you know, we have a patient that goes in and gets a you know, medical assistant or a lab technician. Um, they're gonna go to a, 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 an office and get a lab test uh, or to a doctor's office. And they're gonna go ahead and add uh, their test results to a server and, to a, and, and then they have to go ahead and put it up to a, uh, a testing lab like uh, I don't know, LabCorp or Quest, I guess. And then they're gonna have it, they're gonna take the lab results and get reported either through a system or through an API call. And they store it in their database and then they do some work with it. And then the results get transmitted back to the doctor's office or the hospital or the 
CDC or the FDA or the state health and human resources. Again, just like the supply chain, the data is copied everywhere, right? It's caught being copied and um, there it's, it's, you can't completely trust it. Um, there's no single source of truth and there's no providence in it other than trusting that as these things are being moved into the, 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 the hospital, hospital doctors, healthcare system, uh, the lab core or lab core that their database systems and, and, and are, are accurate and um, being backed up and, and nobody's mudging the data at all. And same with the CDC, FDA and, st and state and health and, and state of the state of uh, the state's health, health and human uh, resources. Um, and an ETL process is typically what's going to, um, you know, do these. So you have these ETL processes. So there's a lot of IT involved here, a lot of copying data. And there's also a pretty big time lag too, because, you know, when do these things run? Are they run, um, you know, in the evening, once a week, once a day? More than likely, they're not transmitting these things in real time. They could be, but I doubt it. I mean, I'm sure the CDC gets the data, you know, um, nightly or something like that as they ETL these from all these labs or report them. So, you know, this is this, this is what's in, something like this is in place right now. I, again, I don't have any intimate knowledge of this, but I'm sure this is what's what's happening um, in some fashion. If we apply blockchain, it, it, it cleans the picture up a little bit more. But the, the bottom line here is, is as these tr these lab tests, i.e. transactions are executed, they, they uh, um, make their way into the blockchain. And in a near real time fraction, they're replicated to all the nodes. So one benefit right now you would get now you could still do something like this with the traditional data store. You don't have to have blockchain to have you know, real time results, right? You can have um, uh, um, all kinds of systems that make them real time. And as a matter of fact, one use case blockchain is not uh, good for it would, at this point would be like a financial transaction, stock markets and things like that because of the, the consensus latency involved. Um, it, it's, not, it's not that fast. There's, there's things working to try to fix that, but for right now, um, uh, that would not be a good use case. However, this, near real time update of lab transactions that everybody in the blockchain, I add a transaction and they get replicated around and everybody has their own node and access they can get at that data and do it is a lot better than what's currently going on, which is uh, not in close to real time. So there you can see how blockchain. So what hap would happen here is um, each doctor's office or state agency or whatever would have either their own node that they would govern and maintain and, and could access or there would be rampant API points to where a node could be stood up and an API opened up and people could be granted access to that with a digital certificate. So that's that topology is going to is yet to be determined. My guess would be that um, the, the, the blockchain would be governed and maintained by a, a quasi governmental association that would care and feed the network and provide node access to whoever um, that wanted it. Um, uh, that was th that had had the proper credentials to access it. So, this is how blockchain could be applied to the uh, lab testing. Why is this better? I kind of talked about this. Multiple EPI and API mechanisms eliminated. Single trustworthy source of lab results. Near real time access. No wait time for ETL process. I'm rehashing this. I apologize. Immutable reported results cannot be altered purposely or accidentally. History is preserved. And, you know we don't we don't update transactions or blocks, it's not possible. We append, so it keeps growing. Um, and uh, uh, that transaction history is available. So if you, um, in the lab result, when I add a lab result for positive and then they recover, I have that history, right? I don't, they don't lose it. You don't, I don't update a record, I append a new transaction. So we have the history of, 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 of transactions because uh, we append, we don't update. Um, and then, of course, distributed nature makes it uh, safe from losing data. You know, if, if data backs aren't performed, then database is lost. So let me jump into the implementation. So that's teeing up why the case for why I, the blockchain would be a good, uh, a good uh, uh, possible solution for lab test results. Um, I'm going to walk through a fabric implementation here that we built. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know this before, but this is all open sourced. I mean, it's out there and I have some links I'll show you. 
Um, the presentation we'll make available, and I have the links in the presentation here, but what I'm going to show you and talk through is all built and implemented, and um, you can be consumed and look at it and do what you want with it. Um, uh, it, it to me, it's a great way, um, you know, as, as a as a IT person, a software practitioner, I, I understand things by seeing things work. As a matter of fact, that's how blocks, I, you know, in blockchain, I, I being a developer, uh, seeing, um, uh, I actually installed a Bitcoin node and source code and watched how it worked. And that's how I understood the concept. Which to me, that's how I, I learned. So if you're, if you're technical um, and, and have that kind of wherewithal, I recommend you grabbing this and it's got instructions on how to set it up and get it running. And you'll, you'll basically have a, you're going to have a whole blockchain network with the UI and everything else. I just showed you in that picture running on your, on a single machine, which is, which can be useful. Um, so chain code is add installed to add lab transactions. Chain code is, is, uh, is a synonym for smart contract. Um, uh, and so, uh, in, in fabric and I, I install chain code to, uh, perform operations. I can query, add lab transactions, do things. And that's, that's, actual code being executed like a stored procedure inside the blockchain. It's secured, it's signed, it's added. So in, in, in a fabric blockchain implementation, you can store and do whatever you want as long as you um, write chain code to do it. So in this case, um, I am going to go ahead, when a lab result is invoked, a transaction is invoked, chain code is executed that will add this information to the blockchain. And this is the and this is HIPAA compliant de-identified data. So I have the, the UUID, to, uh, uh, universal, uh, this could be a global a GUID, but I, I chose a U, UUID to U, universally uniquely identify a lab transaction. I want it to be anonymous. I don't want to have any meaningful information in that ID or identifying information. The lab source, lab core request, whoever. Uh, date, time, age, 10 year age ranges. So it can't be, again, de-identifying the data. So we're, instead of the actual age or date of birth, we're going to put in a 10 year age range for the, for the, for the uh, lab transaction, city, county, um, and test type of the, of the lab transaction test result, positive, negative or whatever. And, and there's other kinds of results I understand, but we just put positive, neg 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 negative, negative for simplicity. Um, and the status would be negative recovered or deceased, unfortunately. So those are the three statuses that, that we have in there. So that transaction is stored down there. Um, here. And uh, so, um, so uh, that this what I'm about to show you is in all these open source projects. Again, we'll put the PDF up there with this kind of stuff. So, um, uh, um, excuse me, I'm put all uh, so you can have access to it. Virus tracker is the fabric network. It's the peer node, endorsing node, order say. So basically, this is the fabric network implementation. Um, it's, it's all Dockerized, so you start it up, and and what you're going to see is this network running on my machine. Um, the Keyhole Fabric API Gateway. This is a uh, uh, a generic API gateway we built, and this is in um, actually an open source project in Hyperledger uh, Labs. So it's been accepted into that, and it's just a generic API gateway. If you if you're working in Hyperledger and writing applications, <clears throat> excuse me, this could be useful because it's just an API gateway uh, generically. It uses the, um, it's a uh, uh, Node.js gateway. It uses the uh, uh, G the JavaScript SDK to access a network. So if you're writing applications that have to access network nodes, this generic API gateway would solve your need. It's got authentication on it. It's got some, some um, it eliminates a lot of boilerplate code that you'd have to do uh, normally. Um, and that's out there on uh, Hyperledger Labs. Um, and then the Key World Virus Tracker UI is a UI. So the UI is a React.js UI that talks to the gateway, and the gateway talks to the blockchain network to get to add transactions or to query transactions out of the blockchain to display it in a human visual GUI in the web. So these are the three projects all open sourced that you're, you go grab and check out. I'll show it to you now. Um, before I do that, there are some transactions that can be executed so I'm from the CLI, so you can create labs. There, in the project, there are some uh, test SDKs that, that will, will allow you to start the network up and run, run the CLI commands, command line interface commands to interact with the network without, you know, with just a, 
without headless. And then there's some Java, uh, JavaScript um, uh, commands to um, mark the labs as recovered or deceased. So this is how you can interact with the network outside of a UI. API Gateway looks like this, provides access and, trans and, and transaction invocations to the network. And that's the user interface. I'll show you this live, but this is just a React.js user interface that um, uh, basically is, is, is querying the transactions in the blockchain, again, through the API Gateway. The API Gateway is using the, uh, the SDK, uh, JavaScript SDK, that accesses the blockchain and queries it. And you can see here I have, you know, and I, I, for those folks that are not in the US, I apologize. We probably will make a world map at this point. There's no reason we couldn't, but just out of the gate, we made this as a US map, but there's no reason this couldn't be a world map. We may change that, but, and, it, and basically I'm querying the blockchain and through the gateway and, and then the UI is reflecting um, statistics, you know, total tested, total negative, um, I got a little graph down here. It's kind of, for those of you who've seen the John Hopkins site, it's kind of, you know, taken off from their their uh, their lab testing site. So, you know, you can see. Imagine if blockchain was rolled out to all the labs um, in, in the country, and it was up and running, and this app was running right here. As tests came in, they would be almost immediately reflected here. That could be very powerful and useful um, for for battling this um, this virus. I think having this information in an almost real-time fashion. And we got them by um, state here. So two channels. So another, you know, in, 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 in Fabric, you have a notion of a channel and a channel is really a, a ledger. So imagine a blockchain network and I can have as many channels or ledgers as I want in that network. It's not just one ledger and one channel like Bitcoin where you have one, one ledger. This is multiple ledgers. So I can have a network out there. I have multiple channels slash ledgers. In this case, we chose to have an influenza channel and a COVID channel, or I could have a, 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 a smallpox channel or a whatever. I can, I, you can have each, each channel will have lab results um, for a particular virus. So that's how we chose to, to architect this. I have as many channels as I want just to help delimit, delimit and, and, and partition the, uh, the data. Instead of having you know, instead of having one big giant ledger with a, t a lab type that I have to cipher through, we just would have a ledger for every virus type in our case. And you'll pick that. And governance is the hardest part. So that's what I want to kind of, I'm going to, I'm going to show you the app running here. So you see it, uh, the pieces and parts of it in a second, but I wanted to point out this is who owns, who operates and who trusts. This is what is the hard, is the hard, hard part i mean we somebody needs to take ownership of it operations is a big deal you know there's it involved we got to stand nodes up we got to stand you know in, in fabric there's a notion of an orderer so there's a certificate authority somebody has to access and re and add and revoke certificates certificate management's a big deal um uh you know somebody has to make sure the nodes are up and running you know if everybody um uh, or at least has the ability to troubleshoot those nodes, uh, who owns it, who's going to be saying you can get in, you can not get in, right? <laughs> that kind of thing. So those are, that's the hard part. I think that's really what stands in the way a lot, to, to a lot of blockchain adoption is just this governance and, 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 and ownership of, of it. You know, in a competitive um, uh, environment, it's tough, you know, in the supply chain, you know, you're going to have a lot of people saying, well, I don't want them to see my, and, and, and in Fabric, to be fair, you can, you can, you have private data. So there are, there is, you know, there's ways to have data in the blockchain that only certain parties can see, which is great, but still people are going to say, I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not comfortable with my competitors being involved in the same thing. I want to have my own, my own competitive IT solution. So we got to overcome that, I think, to, to get some, some, some acceptance. Um, so I think this is going to be the, the, the hardest part of, uh, of, uh, of, of blockchain adoption in general, not just for in, in any use case, but I, I, I feel like these barriers will come down and the technology will make its way uh, into the, into the you know, more adoption. So let me get out of this for a second. And I got a browser up here. 
Uh, so here's the the React app running, and you see here I can check, I can click the graph changes as I select total recovered, total tested. You know, I can look at all the results that are in in the blockchain. See there the identified data. Um, I can add if you know if I was adding a result. Now this isn't super realistic, but what would happen is a a lab would have an API. They would call this API that the React app is calling, and I could say quest date time anatomical gender male or female age range test type you know negative status active recovered pick city where I'm at and county I'll pick one and then hit create at that moment that all the all the you see that all the all the blockchain nodes would have that result that we're participating into it. Um, this is all local on my machine, but imagine having a network out there. So um, you can grab this if you want. I can, um, if I want to select the virus channel, I can go to the influenza channel, or I can go to the COVID channel. Like I said, this is this React app is talking to APIs. If I was a research facility, if I was a healthcare hospital, a government entity or anybody, I could access this data without React. And just if I had credentials to it, I could access it and crunch the numbers or do whatever statistics I need to do on this and, and, and work with it in a different way. It doesn't have to be this React app. So hopefully you see the power in that. Um, the projects are out here on GitHub. Here is uh, the virus tracker UI. This is all public, open sourced. Here's the uh, gateway out on Hyperledger Labs. There's instructions on how to get it up and running locally or deployed. And then here is the virus tracker. This is a this is a um, full network that you install and run locally, or you can deploy it out if you want to. But it has everything you need in here, all instructions on how to run it. So uh, that's. Uh, I encourage you to go check it out. I think if you're if you're new to blockchain and you're technical, this would be very useful um, to to uh, to get it all up and running. It it it, um, it it runs in Windows or Mac or Linux or wherever you want to do it. And uh, um, if you have any questions out there, just go ahead on the on these projects while you're doing it. You can respond on, on GitHub. Um, and right now, um, I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have for you know for this presentation. Hey, David, this is uh, Peter Camille. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great. Uh, since the chat wasn't available, I figured I'd uh, just shout out. So I was curious how so you talked about the existing infrastructure and how everything sort of gets, you know, shared across multiple servers and has to go back and forth. And then you showed a solution like with blockchain, but that would sort of require sort of everyone going to blockchain. Is there an intermediate solution like, you know, where, like, how can you sort of bridge the gap where you develop maybe like a blockchain solution, like, you know, where people own and control their own personal data and test results, and they can then, um, you know, Publish. decide yeah. whether they want to share that with people. But how would you get, like, with the, exi with the existing infrastructure that's in place now, labs to verify that yes this person tested positive or negative or has the uh the antibodies and is you know safe to you know safe to enter my workplace or or my the sports venue or whatever and i want to oh, verify yeah. that person's results but but how do you get like my question is sort of like how do you get that you know and how do you do it without getting like every single lab onto your platform is there like a central is there currently a central place where the cdc or the who has all this and there can be one central point to sort of verify someone's test results. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, first off, I don't know, I, I, I'm not really in that space. This is more, some of this uh, idea came from um, 
a thought experiment of blockchain, a good, what I think would be, what we thought would be a good blockchain use case. So I want to make sure that I don't, I don't really have That's a, a great you know, use case. Um, uh, it, uh, uh, it, it, it odd, but I can guess a little bit. So let me see if I can try to, so the first thing is, let's say Cerner is a big, um, around here and around everywhere, a big patient healthcare software company, right? So more likely, like when I go to my doctor, they use Cerner. I, I'm IT, so I always pay attention to the software they're using when they're, you know, when we're in the doctor's office and, and they use Cerner. So if I go in and get an influenza test as a swab um, uh, at, at my doctor's, um, they are going to go ahead and, 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 and somehow get that information into Cerner, which is some Cerner system in their data store, and somehow that's going to get transmitted to Quest. I'll say Quest was here, and and uh, they're probably um, uploading that either through an API at some point. I don't know when. I, I don't know how that happens. But to answer your question, if 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 the CDC said um, that yes, this has to also go to the blockchain. You don't need that. Your normal line of business systems need to stay intact. We can't disrupt those. But we need this information. That would be a matter of Quest or Cerner of putting a a, a call into their software that would also negotiate and talk to the to the API gateway. They wouldn't have to, they could participate by simply having credentials. They wouldn't have to spin up a node. They wouldn't have to have a, any of that stuff. They would just be provided a credentialed access to say, please publish, make make this call with the information. And okay. um, I mean, that that that's the, 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 the easy answer, but they wouldn't have to say, so you got to spin up a node and understand blockchain. It would be simply somebody like the CDC saying, hey, Quest, LabCorp, here's our, we got a blockchain network set up. You need to call, here's your credentials. You need to do this. You, and this is where the hammer comes in. Walmart did that with lettuce. They have a blockchain right. supply chain technology and they, their hammer. They said, if you want to do business with us, you're doing it. So all these people participating from the producers or whatever, they have no choice. They have to get some IT and they got to call that API. They don't have to set up a blockchain network, but they were given, I'm sure, credentials. And here's your credentials. You're approved. However you do it, either you have somebody write a UI and type this in, or you call it. But you will, if you want to, if we're, if we're gonna, if you're gonna sell your lettuce in our stores, you're gonna do this. And okay. So I, so, I don't have a question. So That's Quest really would get, so Quest would get credentials to use an API, yes. and then they their software would, you know, use those credentials, and that API would then add the test results to the blockchain in an Correct. immutable way, and then okay. So, so the 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 somebody like the CDC or or have to set it that up and have a robust node. And Questor may or may not want to know, but they would be given ac access. Anybody else that would want to. And then the question would be, anybody could query it. So they would be given credentials to where they would be able to add transactions, right? And then you and I theoretically, if they wanted to have a mobile app, the the CDC would say, we got this public API here into our blockchain that anybody could use. Now, um, uh. If I was so, so you could make a mobile app and it would be publicly available for everybody. Now, yeah, there's but, privacy concerns there, though. That's why oh, yeah. I went back oh, yeah. to the point of I'd want this to be a blockchain where, um, where this data is encrypted and only the the person, the individual who took the test, only he has the keys to unencrypt that and decide who he wants to share it with. And as well, I so, said, the, the the use case yeah. might be, oh, for me to enter this restaurant, I have to show that verify that i've tested so my app is going to you know share that information of you know what my test results were you know to enter that yes. venue for example or that meat packing so, plant or that nursing home for example correct and so that's that's a, that's a really good point and what would happen here is is let's get into some it if what's going to happen is a uuid is going to come back quest and the cerner and everybody else still has to cross reference that unique unidentified ID with their internal records, right? Because they still got to be able to say, you know, Dave Pitt had this test and they have to do that. That's not in the blockchain, but in their internal systems, that's still there, right? I mean, that's, right. that's yeah, got to still be, need that off chain storage, right? Yes. You still need that. You still need that. Dave Pitt took a lab uh, influenza test and the UI, UUID he got back from the global lab results store is this. That's unique. And they have to, they have to do that in their own systems to track that. Kind of like you're saying that UUID that came back for you. It doesn't mean it's, if it does, they get some information back from it, but it's your UUID. Nobody else knows what it is. They if they look at that. If they looked at the block store data, it means nothing because there's nothing identifiable in it. Um, that UUID is it's kind of like uh, the hat in, in Bitcoin. The the the, the yeah. The so if it's a unique, 
if it's a unique hash with yeah. nothing personally identifiable, then yeah. That, so then, um, this, hi, that could be stored hi. on chain. Yeah. Um, so that that would be stored on chain along with the test results. Right. Okay. Uh, this is Kim. I mean, you know, you, we look at it to see, I, I look at it slightly differently. I think that more and more what's going to happen is that if you want to take control of your own data and your own credentials, what you do is you create your own identity and attach the credentials to that. Eventually, what would happen is that that credentials could actually be signaled out to the various lab uh, or let's just now let's talk about the lab uh, lab court and they can come back and say yay uh, positive true or false so that would instill in it the zero knowledge proof concept mm -hmm. and so and so there's no privacy um that will be um i think will be preserved there so i think that you know if we want to look to someone to do that or do we want to do it ourselves i think we're going to evolve into the fact that each identity will have will create its own credentials yes yes like like bitcoin yes yeah, yeah. but yeah. but you own that and you own it in your wallet so yes. let's say for example if you travel you need a, a, a you know a, a doctor's certificate to say that you can travel so you go to your doctor and then you get a a, a note then yeah, you can yeah. upload that note and have that actually you know, sent verified. Mm -hmm. It becomes a verifiable credentials that you can attach and then scan through um, you know uh, security or do a um, an airline app or something. So I think yeah, that's if, what if, the if you like an app. If you, uh, yeah, I see your point. So you could go to the, if I went to the doctor, got my tests in your scenario. I would have like my wallet. Let's say wallet's on my phone. I would show like a. QR code or something to them that exactly. would be attached attached to it from there forward it's in there it's unique I'm the only one that knows it, and I could use that but then I could it could be the systems could interact and if I went to an airport I could say and it would a scan it my would QR say code and, positive yeah. you know true or, true or false that's it it's coming down to if we you know more and more if you want to preserve privacy you want go you want to yeah. go towards zero proof knowledge uh, excuse yeah. me zero knowledge proof yeah so, yeah. so Kim, what this is Pete again. So, what you're saying then is you'd establish your own identity. Yes. You would upload your own test results, and yeah. then a ver a certified verifier yes. would verify that this is correct, yes. and you know put their stamp of approval on it. No different whether it's my test results or my diploma from college or exactly. you know, my my that my utility bill to show that I live at this address. Exactly. Um, and that, and then I would decide who I'm, sh what information I'm sharing with uh, others. Yes. No. Okay. So, so I look at it. Identity to mean it can be an individual, it could be an asset, a digital asset, etc. So that's what we're building towards. You, you yeah. need to, you know, I, I think we, what we want to do is, you know, if you want to talk about owned your own identity and owned your own privacy and control, that's what you go towards. Yeah. Well, and and the case and that and, and the point and I, and this is great. I mean, this this discussion is fantastic because it's, it's justifying it. But I hope what people took away from this was the implementation of that blockchain is justified because it is its structure and the way it is is, is trustless. It has to be. If you try to do this with a traditional database, there it, it would not be um, trustworthy, right? I mean, if you tried to what we're talking the scenario we're talking about because there's no reason we couldn't have unique caches and identifies and use a traditional IT system like a SQL Server or whatever. But the problem is, is um, it's it's not trustworthy. But with blockchain, I'm sure is going to be the solution because you, you at least you can prove that this data, my identity and my test result has not changed. I can I can be rest assured that somebody didn't change it to positive. <laughs>